Hello everyone and welcome to Word of Mouth. Word of Mouth is an adult story time presented by the Dooley Hampton Morgan Memorial Library. My name is Andrew Foster and today I'm joining Amy Campbell uh, to read Till Death Do Us Part by Tim Molini. If you enjoy today's program and want uh, to come for the next one, we meet every first and third Thursday of the month at 12.10 p.m. Central Time in the Global Classroom. This program is being recorded live and will be posted at a later date for you to enjoy again on our YouTube and Facebook pages. As a reminder, some stories that we do read for this program contain adult language and content. It's recommended you review these stories before allowing younger audiences to listen. And now, Till Death Do His Part by Tim Molini. The chemist and the botanist stepped into the dining room at precisely the same moment, entering from opposite doors. They smiled at each other as they took their places at the square table. Happy anniversary, said the chemist. His blue eyes were bright and friendly behind wire frame glasses, but his smile was tentative, the corners of his mouth twitching slightly. He wore an old cardigan she had given him years ago, but he looked vaguely uncomfortable, as if the only piece of clothing that suited him was a white lab coat. And to you, replied the botanist, her voice much younger than her steel-colored hair suggested. As she returned his smile, the lines around her eyes radiated outward like the rays of a sun in a child's drawing. Years in the field studying tropical plants had aged her skin like leather. Sixty years, said the chemist, shaking his head. The botanist nodded. We married young. At a time when marriage meant something. Indeed. There's a reason they call them wedding vows, said the chemist solemnly. As long as you both shall live, intoned the botanist. Till death do us part, replied her husband. Just, Just so. so, they spoke in unison. They sat quietly for a moment, letting their eyes drift to the table. An elaborate dining set lay before them, half the dishes white and the other half black. Food of every conceivable color, texture, and smell filled the bowls and covered the dishes. Soup tureens bubbled, wine glasses glistened in the late morning light, salads rustled in the breeze from the ceiling fan. Covered dishes, bowls large and small, plates white and black, all overflowing, with a feast that would put both Julia Child and Martha Stewart to shame if the former were not dead and the latter not in jail. Such a feast, said the husband, his eyes wide. Our best yet, agreed the wife, licking her lips. Well, it is a special occasion. Anniversaries come only once a year. And this is our 60th. That's a long time. To be married. 60 years, sighed the wife. Of travel, mused the husband. Adventure, discovery, romance, infidelity, dining, Drinking. Nagging. More drinking. More nagging. Hypocrisy. Flatulence. Snoring. Boring. Hungry? Asked the wife, forcing a smile. Famished. The husband nodded, the corners of his mouth struggling northward. The wife spread her arms across the table, palms out in invitation. What would you like to try first? She asked. What would you recommend? The soup looks very nice, she said, pushing a bowl across the table. A thick greenish-brown broth sent clouds of steam into the air, momentarily obscuring her features. The chemist leaned forward, waving some of the steam across his face. He wrinkled his nose. May I ask where you got the recipe? England, she replied cautiously, looking down at the table. Ah. He smiled, nodding. Lily of the Valley, scientific name, Convalaria Magellis. Commonly found in eastern Britain, it has white, bell-shaped flowers and orange berries. Such a fine memory, she replied admiringly. Frequently mistaken for wild garlic and made into a soup. He continued nodding. Causes hot flashes, headache, skin irritation, dilated pupils, vomiting, nausea, and slowed heartbeat, leading, of course, to coma, followed by death. The botanist frowned as her husband pushed the bowl away with a satisfied smile. England, he said. That was a lovely trip. Lovely, she agreed. The Tower of London. Buckingham Palace. The changing of the guard. Big Ben. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. 
Perhaps I should serve you, he suggested. You'll have to eat something, she reminded him. That is the agreement, isn't it? Every year, she said, nodding. Divorce would be unthinkable, he replied. Uncivilized, she agreed. Immoral. Barbaric. Try this, he said, pushing a bowl across the table. A new recipe. She eyed the orange and red dish suspiciously. Curry chicken, he replied. An Indian dish. A taste of nirvana, he suggested. She frowned. The dog button plant? He shrugged. Strychnos nooks vomica. Strychnine, she said. Found in the seeds and fruit of that native plant of India, the blossoms have an odor resembling curry powder. Beautiful flowers, he said, nodding. Attacks the central nervous system, she continued, causing agonizing muscle spasms, beginning with the head and neck. Famous for the violent convulsions of the poisoning victim, which increase in intensity until sudden death occurs. Rigor mortis sets in immediately, leaving behind a horrifying facial grimace. A bit spicy for some, he admitted. She pushed the plate away. That was quite a trip. The Taj Mahal, he said, smiling. Built as a mausoleum for the Sultan's dead wife, you know, she replied. A lovely gesture. Lovely, she agreed. Perhaps an appetizer, he said hopefully. Nuts, she replied. I couldn't agree more, he said, pushing a small bowl of mixed nuts to the center of the table. You first, she prompted. I couldn't. You must. The chemist peered at the bowl for a moment before taking a small handful of nuts and popping them into his mouth. Delicious, he said, chewing loudly and smiling. Such a variety, she said, looking into the bowl. Almonds, hazelnuts, cashews, he said, nodding. Even macadamia and Brazil nuts, you should try some. I think I will, she said, reaching into the bowl. The chemist noticed his wife took only a handful of peanuts, almonds, and cashews, leaving the larger nuts behind. You missed some of the best ones, he said. That was a lovely trip, she replied. Excuse me? Hawaii, she said, home to the kukui nut, those larger ones in the bowl there. The chemist frowned briefly before regaining his composure. So observant for your age, he marveled. Experienced, she replied. They're quite tasty, you know. So I hear, she said. Unlike most poisons, the nut apparently aren't bitter at all. They do contain jatropin, however, a violent purgative. Difficulty breathing is followed by a sore throat, dizziness, and vomiting before drowsiness and death ensue. The nuts are worn as good luck charms, he insisted. She nodded. A curious culture, Hawaii. Warrior kings. And queens. The hula. And Don Ho. Tiny bubbles. The husband sang. Salad, asked the wife, proffering a bowl overflowing with mixed greens. Recipe, he asked. California, she replied. Something domestic, he said appraisingly, arching his eyebrows. This could be the safe bet, huh? Grown right here on American soil. Land of the free, she said, nodding. Home of the brave, he muttered, squinting at the bowl. Some dressing, she reached for a bottle next to the salad. Hemlock, he replied. Pardon? Hemlock, he repeated. Conium maculatum also known as poison hemlock, lesser hemlock, or muskrat weed. Formerly only native to Europe and Asia. Both faraway lands, she suggested. But naturalized in the United States and found on both the eastern and Pacific coasts. The leaves are said to be harmless in spring, she said defensively. It's autumn. How time flies. Life is fleeting, he agreed. Hemlock weakens the muscles, causing a loss of sight, shallow pulse, and death from paralysis of the lungs. The mind, however, remains lucid until death. A blessing, she said. Or a curse. The leaves are frequently eaten by quail, by the way, which are immune but pass the poison on through their flesh. So a man could eat a quail that had eaten hemlock and suffer the same effects. Hmm, something to remember for next year, she said with interest. The next hour progressed at a similar pace, with dishes being proffered and declined. Small plates shared judiciously,
tiny sips taken from glasses, large and small. Travels were remembered and stories rec recounted as the clock on the wall measured the passage of time. Still hungry? Asked the husband hopefully, his brow sweating. Famished, the wife nodded, her bright eyes narrowed. Only a few plates left, he observed. Your turn, she replied. Something new, said the husband, gesturing toward a large covered dish to the right of his wife. A surprise, she asked. My own recipe, he answered. But careful opening the lid, I imagine it's still quite hot. Reaching across the table, he offered her a small pot holder of embroidered fabric. How thoughtful, she said, using the pot holder to grasp the cover and expose the dish beneath. As the lid came free, a noxious cloud enveloped the botanist, causing her to push back violently. As the legs of the chair settled back to the floor, she began, began coughing spasmodically, her nostrils flaring. Leaning against the table, she squinted through watery eyes at her husband, who had pushed back from the table and spread a napkin across his face. Cyanide gas. He replied to the unspoken question. The container was airtight. Coughing should lead to a shortness of breath, then fainting, followed by convulsions and death. The botanist pushed herself up in her chair, wheezing. <gasps> you cheated, she said accusingly. That wasn't a food, she rasped. You broke the rules. The chemist shrugged. I'm tired. His wife nodded her understanding, trying to find her voice. Of the lying, she said. The fighting, he replied. The guilt. She struggled to remain conscious, her breath coming in short gasps. Leaning across the table, she smiled weakly and extended her left hand. Her wedding ring glistened in the candlelight. You were always so clever, she said warmly. The chemist came forward in his chair, a smug smile on his wrinkled face. And you were always so tenacious, he said admiringly. Sixty <coughs> years, she coughed. A long time, he said, to be <coughs> married, she answered, opening her hand. Sixty years. The husband took his wife's hand, a sudden hint of sadness in his eyes. As their fingers touched, the botanist clenched her fist around her husband's hand in an iron grip. He tried to pull away, but too late felt the barb on her wedding ring cut into his flesh. His eyes widened in horror as he looked across the table at his grinning wife. You cut me! He cried. A small needle affixed to my wedding band, she rasped, laughing and coughing at the same time. Soaked in curare. Curare? He repeated in a voice pitched in fear. Strychnos toxifera, <coughs> she wheezed, found in Central and South America where it was used in the na by the natives for poison-tipped arrows. The flying death, he whispered. Exactly, she nodded, blinking and struggling to keep her head erect. Paralysis <coughs> starts in the eyes and face, spreading until it reaches the diaphragm and the lungs, at which point the victim dies of asphyxiation. Quickly, said the chemist, quietly, his breath shallow. Within seconds, <coughs> she said, coughing one last time as she fainted across the table. Her left hand still wrapped in a death grip around her husband's. That's cheating, he gasped, knocking plates to the floor as he too passed out and died. Early the next morning, the cleaning service found them, just like that, their hands clasped together. Their bodies were contorted from the effort of stretching across the table with their dying breath. Two paramedics arrived half an hour later. They look so peaceful, said the rookie, her voice hushed. She was in her late twenties, with black hair framing a face that seemed too young and innocent to be chasing death. I'd say determined, said the senior paramedic, his voice gruff and loud in the silent house. He was handsome, but weathered, his face deeply tanned and lined, his sandy hair gray around the temples. You mean the way they're reaching toward each other, said the rookie, like they wanted one final embrace. She smiled sadly, shaking her head. You'll see this a lot, he said. Older couples like this dying within a few minutes of each other. I wonder what the autopsies will show, she said. Won't be much of an autopsy. How come? They were old, he said simply. 
Their heart stopped, then they stopped breathing. Sure looks like natural causes to me. I guess, she said. Happens all the time with married couples. He assured her. There's no medical explanation. One kicks the bucket, and the other dies from a broken heart. That's so sweet. Yeah. He said, rubbing his chin and frowning. They must have really loved each other. The neighbors said it was their anniversary. No kidding. He replied. It's my anniversary this weekend. Are you married? No, she replied, adding, not yet. How long have you been married? Thirty years. He said, wow, that's a long time. To be married? He said, nodding. Are you getting your wife something special? She asked. Actually, I'm going to cook her dinner. He replied. It's a surprise. How romantic, she said. Your wife is one lucky woman. He shrugged. We'll see. This next story is A Dweller in Almond Tea by Genevieve Valentine. The Purnell's housekeeper shows me into the music room where they've shoved the piano to the wall to make room for the coffin and the table and my seat. You can always tell serious clients. They lower the lights. The tablecloth has to be white and linen anywhere I go. It's in the contract. Natural fibers only, I explain if they ask. The old ways, I say sometimes, pitched a tone lower than usual. It usually ends the discussion. People like the old ways. The old ways sound like money. The old ways they assume must work. None of the dead have complained. I need the tablecloth and a dinner service with utensils all in silver. Silver covers on the dishes and a silver base with clippings of herbs and flowers that I tell them will keep evil out. The list is several dozen long and some of them aren't easy finds. Verbascum, coriander, peony, rosemary, hawthorn, black mustard, all in flour with larch bark as wrapping. But I've never sat down to a dinner and had any missing. The herbs cover the smell. After you've touched the plate to the corpse, you don't want whatever they've used on the body to linger. When I first started, I did the ascetic routine with bread and wine straight out of a wooden bowl because it looked suitably staged and it was faster to choke down. But people who are paying you the cost of a house for your services will still serve you stale grocery bread as their final transubstantiation on this earth. And eventually, my patience ran out. You need to eat. That's an old way there's no getting out of. But I have standards. Now, I ask for the deceased's favorite food. It was a good idea. Ideal in five-star dead. It's sweetbreads this time, which always seems like a fuck you from the grave. People claim them as a favorite food just to seem urbane and at peace with the transience of the flesh, when really all they want is the noodle soup from around the corner when they were drunk, or the peanut butter and jelly sandwich their mom made for them once back when she was yet to be disappointed in them, which means I'm left eating fried throats and staring at the deceased across the table while we both know better. I don't know why they bother to hide it. They can't hide anything. It's why I'm there. There aren't many of us. You have to be born with the accidental hunger and the endless appetite. Rare gift, say some people who have no idea what they're talking about. Most of the people who can do it just think they've lost their minds, unless someone recognizes them, taps them on the shoulder before the worst happens. The appetite still drives you to the brink sometimes. But sin eaters need money like anyone else, and sins are easier to swallow than poverty is. Asking for us by naming what we do won't get you anywhere. Most people won't believe you. The ones who do will think you're gauche. You find me by mentioning Amit, the beast who stalks the kingdom of the dead to the west of the Nile rough-fleshed and lion-footed, a crocodile's head with impassive eyes. She sat at the weighing of the soul, reptile teeth gleaming, to consume the hearts of the sinful. The old ways, best marketing tools you can come by. And it's the heavy-hearted who come looking for us. Someone who's done a lot of terrible things and has the money to turn back the clock will realize the shadows beginning to fall and they'll start going to invite-only gallery after-parties, hosting private dinners, asking quietly about who knows anything of use. 
Those types always know something if they're rich enough. And they love nothing better than a secret code. Sooner or later, when they say, I'm looking to live to the west of the Nile, someone will write down a number and say in flat English, I know a dweller in, Amun on, in Amunti. That will be my number. I'll take care of it all. Riders on my contract. Number one, no one in the room with me. I'm a professional. I demand the courtesy. It's not hard to enforce. The people who need this service don't tend to have overdevoted families. And by the time they read my contract to the bottom, they don't much feel like arguing this one. Number two, client confidentiality goes both ways. I don't go to the press about what I discover. The old ways demand my silence, even from you, and your family never mentions my name. This one they always break. If they didn't, I'd never get business. The table, the white cloth, the silver, the herbs, trappings of the trade. This is where they get to enjoy paying through the nose for a premium service and start to feel like they've gotten the best in the business. It was the same among my ancestors, I assure them, and explain canopic jars as if they're the same thing. No one's ever questioned it. Number four, do not open the door, no matter what you hear. This is where they go quiet for a long time before they sign their name. First sins I ever ate were my grandmother's. She sat me down in the kitchen one day. There was a copper chicken mold hanging on the wall like a talisman in case you wanted to make chicken cake and handed me a cookie still tacky from the tray. You're getting so tall, she said, like it was my fault, and told me stories about going to school in her village. And I gnawed my way through an almond cookie that was sweet and chewy and burnt just at the edges. She'd wasted her life. She hated her husband for taking her from her home country. She'd resented my father for pinning her there and couldn't forgive his white English wife. She'd envied every woman with a byline she ever came across. Her faith was gone. Half a dozen times she'd sat at her dressing table and wondered how hard you'd have to drive your head into the wall to kill yourself. She was going to die any day. She knew it. She knew it for sure, and she wanted it all to be over. There were cats everywhere back home, she told me. When you walked alone at night, it was a sea of tails and eyes. She was praying all the while. If you're there, call my name. I'm so ready to be gone. I didn't know what was happening. I thought I was killing her. I ate three cookies, one at a time. Englishmen used to eat the sins right off the body. A plate of bread and a cup of wine rising slowly as the corpse bloat set in. And sometimes a little meat if any could be spared and you could manage to finish before the flies reached it. You always could manage. You ate it all because there was no telling where your next meal was coming from if everyone was healthy and young. The stories mark out where a sin eater lived on the edges of the wilderness in some half home with the trees or the open sky ready to swallow him, but never how they were summoned. Was there someone assigned to the job or did some mourner have to break first? Someone who left the body and staggered over the ground beyond the safety of the town, screaming for the sin eater to hurry. They would have had to run as soon as the death rattle came, that poor soft heart with tears in their eyes. Sins have to be eaten before the body goes cold. And on a diet of true believers, a sin eater is so full he can barely lift his head. He'd have had to drag himself most of the way on all fours, as fast as he could. Wolves were everywhere back then, until he was close enough that he had to stand and look like he could do the job to comfort the people who paid him to be outcast and hated for eating the worst of whatever they'd done. Strange where some stories wander from home. You begin with the outcast beast in the forest who consumes the dying obligingly and whole. When he's found and cut open and filled up again with stones, all anyone remembers is the messenger in red. Was that first mourner also the one who cut the bread and poured the wine for the sin eater? 
Was that the understood office of the first person to beg mercy for the dead? Was it their wooden bowl and cup given to the stranger across the body of the one they loved? I hope it was. You could pretend that was a kindness. The Middle Kingdom knew better how to prepare a body with some circumspection. Still, they left the heart in. Our kind is doomed to press food to the flesh. There are rumors I've never really wanted to track down about sin eaters who were made to drink the blood of the dead as a proof of their work, from the palm or the skull or the stomach. Corpse bowls. You'd have had to suck at the wound. Blood congeals so fast. You'd have had to work for every sludgy mouthful. They're probably just stories. Anyone who knows what happens when a body dies hopes they're just stories. I don't think about it. It has nothing to do with me now, with half a dozen pieces of silver in a line between me and the dead. Of course, they're serving red. A sin eater has to separate the taste of the sin from the food, or they'll never eat another easy meal. I won't anyway. For the rest of my life, I'll be accidentally confessing short order cooks who are two days shy of a heart attack. But it can be managed if you work at it. You have to work at it. You don't want to taste any more than you have to. It's tempting to eat the sins of everyone I love. It's tempting to eat the sins of everyone good. We can ease suffering. It's easy to mistake that for a calling. Every so often you give in. I carry something in my bag for emergencies, a granola bar I can lay against the heart of a friend gone too soon, or of a stranger shot down in the street, someone who won't have time to make peace. You shove it into your mouth all at once, press both hands tight to your mouth to stop the burst of screaming. Bystanders assume you're the next of kin. You look so upset, they'll explain later. You shouldn't do that. Sins regretted are worse than stones. Mistakes happen. You can, if you want, touch an almond cookie to the still warm body of your grandmother, staring at her closed eyes as you eat as fast as you can manage through a dry throat, scrambling to be gone before anyone comes in and sees you. It won't work. When your parents find you too late, you'll be sobbing against the rug because you got so heavy you couldn't stand anymore. When your father tries to lift you, he won't be able. You'll learn to stand up under it, eventually. It's a trick of the trade. You'd think some sins would taste heady, forbidden, worth it. An affair would be sharply sweet. A murder would taste of panic and lurching triumph. A lie would taste like escape or spring. If it did, there would be more of us. A love affair is stale breath. A murder is sweat. A lie is a fingernail of dirt. Just as well I'm choking down sweet meats. After a while, it tastes of salt, no matter what you do. I live in a small house, way out from the center of the city, at the edge of the wild. It's far enough away from people that when the sun sets, all I hear are the insects buzzing and the edges of the hunger like a wolf pacing always just shy of the trees. When I eat, I have the sluggish rumble of the crocodile whose mouth is open wide. When I'm hungry, wolves. I've known one sin eater who lived in the middle of the city. He called himself an afterlife consultant to be funny. He got a lot of business. His line when clients asked where the sins went or why he did it was, damned if you do, damned if you don't. He shot himself eventually. No one would touch the body. One of his clients finally called me in and the funeral home director stood at a safe distance as I touched my friend's chest with a donut. It's the only thing he had in the house. It soaked up a little blood. Forced myself through it one bite at a time, trying not to look at anything above his sternum. It took 20 bites. By the end, I couldn't breathe. I could see stars every time my teeth came together. There was nothing to eat. You owned all the sins you ate. I'd always wondered. He was teeming, and the donut was gone, 
and not one sin of it was mine. He's clean, I said finally. Had to clear my throat and try again before it sounded like words. At home, I sat at my kitchen table and tried to not and tried not to look up where the copper chicken had been in a kitchen a long time ago. It smelled almonds everywhere. Your clients will always ask you, where do the sins go? As if you're a patissier who's managed to keep the weight off. For them, it's a fair question. Keeping things in their proper places is a life's pursuit for the kind of people who want to outsource their sins. When they see my skin is brown, when they hear my pronunciation of almond tea, they get a look of relief you can't imagine. Once, someone's personal secretary asked me, what's the loss rate in your profession? So flat, it took me a second to realize she was asking about suicides. Lower than yours, I said, because I had some numbers for both. My clients drive a lot of people to the grave. And just before she opened the door, she had said tightly, if you have apprenticeships, I'm all yours. If there was one, I'd have let her. She'd been in training to eat someone else's wrongs for long enough. You'd think clients would ask what will happen to you, too, just to make sure their vessel's in good shape. But they never do. What happens to you isn't their concern. They just ask where their sins go to make sure they won't be pressed cheek by jowl with the stranger's real estate considerations. Every sin eater has a different line for this question. Inside joke. Mine's always been, sin is a renewable resource. They usually laugh. Eco-marketing terms are more familiar than death and slightly less frightening. And they can be fond of renewable resources now after making a living off building stock markets otherwise. Every so often, you get one who actually regrets that. And you have five bites in a row that taste like wet money before they taste like salt. They'll stop asking questions about it after that. Deep down, they're desperate. They know they can't ask too much of you, which is the point. You keep them in the part of you that has no choice, that was born to be forced into, to hold the suffering of others, whether you want it or not, the part that waits with parted teeth for anything it can consume, the part you can't touch or reach, that deep open darkness along your spine that you can never, never fill. For fuck's sake, don't listen if anyone tells you what you are. Don't listen to the hunger. Run until there's no one left. Starve to death if you have to before you do any of this. If you so much as breathe of almond tea, you're doomed. Mr. Purnell and I sit in the room a while, quietly. I touch the bouquet. Move the peony facing out. Move my chair back from the table. The sweetmeats are battered and swimming in a butter sauce with the side of baguette. No wonder he died so young. At least there are no almonds in it. I send back anything with almonds. When I have my nerve, I touch the end of the baguette to the body above the heart, arms out like I'm knighting it, alerting the departed to, alerting the departed to what will happen now. I come back to the table. I take a bite. Mr. Purnell feeds me his sins. The repenting comes after. That list of sorrows isn't in the meat. You get everything first. Everything they've ever done long before the weighing happens. When the black-eyed beast ever opens her jaws to swallow diseased hearts whole. Sometimes a wound so great that the body goes into shock to protect itself instantly. The body knows better than you do. You only realize you've been sliced open when you look down and see the blood. I had one once, a bicycle accident when I was a teen, nearly lost the leg. My knee and shin are made of metal. I still have gravel embedded there. I could probably get it taken out. I don't ask. But once you see the wound, you can't lie to yourself anymore. And you feel every vein and artery swinging gently as your brain tries furiously to process the white noise. The ground turning to sand. The strange deflating feeling that's all the support in your body giving out. It's more than pain. It's too great for pain. It's a total system failure you can never process. The pain is what happens when you live with it. The rest your body can't understand. 
That's the beginning of what it feels like to eat sins. A rabbit being blown up by buckshot is what it feels like to eat sins. Lighting a hill of ants on fire is what it feels like. I make it through half a plate of sweetmeats before the sounds start. The solitude writers in my contract, not because I'll scream, I probably will eventually. I've turned my throat so raw I cough up blood after, but because before that it's utterly silent except for silver on the plate and the sounds of someone eating. There are little taps of the knife against the table, slow and dampened like a bad dream, and the sound of reptile teeth snapping shut, nothing else. It's not a silence people hear much anymore. It's not a sound that's easy to take when you're waiting for something to happen. The screams are welcome. The silence almost got them thinking. You come into this world screaming. You go out in tears. There's no word yet invented for what happens when you and I are in a room alone. There it's the old ways and no mistake, there it's only a corpse gone purple at the bottom and two coins no one will ever take back and the bread soaked through with sweat and your sins gleaming in every maggot and sand under my eyelids and the wrappings still waiting and four jars lined up neatly with the faces watching and my feet aching and my body going heavy everywhere and my throat too dry to swallow but my teeth gleaming wide and the dark night all around us and a long walk home and far off silent coming closer wolves the sounds for that they've never put a name to in the middle kingdom you gave your symbols to the dead but somehow europe spreads out and out and out and someone a thousand years ago comes across a sin eater dragged across the sea to absolve the sinful dying and things become tangled those sin eaters give two calls at the graveside the first is made to the assembled company to assure the living that the sins of the dead have been consumed, that they got their money's worth, a few coins thrown from a distance. Sin eaters shouldn't be encouraged to mingle with the population. The sin eater reassures everyone they've forfeited their soul for the privilege. It's good for business. You don't want them worrying about how they're treating you. They're grieving. When the sin eater goes, they burn the bowl and the cup and anything he touched until nothing's left but the splinters he carries back in his fingertips. The second call the sin eater makes to the dead to keep them where they are, he sings out, come not down the lanes or in the meadows. Nobody's looking for the dearly departed. They want their dead swallowed and gone. I've seen wolves eat. They pull their lips back from their teeth, scrape the meat from the bone, peel it neatly out from the casing of skin. A crocodile opens its mouth and the animal vanishes. When I stand up from the table, there's no sign of my being there. There's no sign anyone's eaten at all. I lick the plate clean, not a drop of wine left over, not a crumb on the cloth. The utensils are perfectly aligned. I drink all the water that the herbs were standing in. This is a religion of its own. You treat it seriously. Europeans of our kind got in trouble in some places back when, from priests who didn't like tr freelance transubstantiation, poaching in the fields of the Lord. We aren't. If there's a Lord, he doesn't have much use for the dear departed. Purnell's son is waiting at the far end of the hall, holding a sealed envelope embossed with his monogram. You must feel terrible, he says. His eyes are filled with tears. They glitter underneath. I fold my hands around the bouquet of herbs and nod once, slowly. They love this part. They're making a story for later. It is done, I say, dropping the contractions so I sound like a seer in a play. Mr. Purnell, the younger, tries hard not to look thrilled as he hands me the envelope with the very tips of his fingers. Once I was dealing with a widower who wasn't going to rest until he knew his wife's transgressions were awful enough to justify my price. He kept me 20 minutes asking. He'd have demanded a list. He was one of those. 
except that I reminded him the old ways bound me to silence, and he'd signed his name to it. It must be a terrible curse, he told me. I told him, like a bad marriage. It's better business to nod and look away. Someone will come looking soon for a house to the west of the Nile, and the new Mr. Purnell should write my, down my number and mention a dweller in almond tea. For people who can afford to have their chefs impress you, my clients provide the lightest meals I've ever had. You have to breathe through all of it. You have to sit through it all until your throat sheds, treads, but you can only eat what the dead considered sins. You can leave a four course dinner still hungry in this line of work. Mr. Purnell's memorial service was busy. He was a powerful man, but night in a cemetery levels everything. Bodies all liquefy the same. I've walked here, barely able to lift my feet because it's important that only my own two legs have brought me. Old ways. I lay the bundle of herbs against the headstone. There are risk. Not all the old ways work the same. Mixed traditions at your peril, but none of the dead have complained. The rosemary goes straight to the back of my throat. It's been nearly 30 hours, but when vomited back up on the grave, the food becomes whole, exactly as it was when I sat down, unknifed, undisturbed. All that's missing is the plate. The ground trembles underneath me, just enough to send up a layer of dust, but my hands are steady as I stick the herbs into the ground like the blade of a sword, and the dirt there trembles and falls away until the meal sinks into the grave and vanishes. I feel lighter. The walk home will be faster than the walk here, but the hunger is already stalking the edges of the vast darkness. An animal prowling for sins, impassive eyes, a jaw crammed with teeth, one paw in front of the other. I let it. I'll take plenty of transgressions to the grave with me, but with some people, however light their conscience is, I know what they've really done. And it's a sin even to ask someone else to carry that. A sin eater has to stand trial for everything he eats. My heart will be devoured someday when I go to the west of the Nile, but not for these. Sin is a renewable resource, I tell them when they ask. Sleep well, Mr. Purnell. See you soon. The bouquet blooms from the hole in the dirt, a last gift for the dead that should keep him right where he is. Come not down the lanes or in our meadows, I say. The sounds that will soon be coming from the grave aren't for human ears, and I turn my back. I've paid my respects. I start the long walk home to the edge of the wild, soft as lion's paws, feeling light and ravenous. Far off, silent, coming closer, wolves.